Uh, before I introduce uh, Megan, I'd like to uh, welcome Jacob. Jacob, can you raise your hand? Jacob's at the back of the room. His dad. Some of you might know Jacob from a a poem that he wrote and presented a couple of years ago is on our website, um, Me Without You, and it's brilliant. He wrote it and, and delivered it here a couple of years ago. So if you haven't seen it, we do have it online at www.fpwr.ca under the video gallery section. There's also video clips there from all the amazing videos we've done, and there's even some from Jennifer Miller, who's coming up soon. But Jacob is here to... Uh, he, he's actually in his second year at college for gemology, and he's teaching... Got it. Thanks, Jacob. <laughs> Keeps me on track. So he creates his own jewelry. Um, it's, it's stunning, beautiful jewelry, and he's selling it today. So no pressure, but we have to support Jacob. So go and have a look at his jewelry. I buy one every year because he makes me. <laughs> but I truly love it. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, I'd like to call up um, Megan Hawkins to introduce our next speaker, who um, is a dear, dear friend of mine and has a four-year-old daughter with... Prader Willie syndrome named Chloe. So if you see Chloe with the blonde curls, you know our poster girl Chloe, this is mom. So mom, you're just as important. Come on up. Hi there. Uh, our next speaker is an amazing doctor and just as importantly an incredible human being. Uh, she's warm, laid back, and infinitely positive, uh, but also a straight shooter. Dr. Jennifer Miller is a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of Florida. For many years, she's been uh, studying brain development in children with Prader-Willi syndrome with uh, a particular focus on growth hormone treatment and uh, its effects on both appetite and brain development. Together with Dr. Daniel Driscoll, also at the University of Florida, Dr. Miller has been conducting a sibling study that many children in this room and their families have likely been a part of. Uh, it's the first of its kind for Prader Willi and one that may yield answers to some of the complex mysteries of Prader Willi syndrome. Dr. Jen, as she's known affectionately to the hundreds of kids that she follows in her clinic, is a veritable fountain of knowledge and we are privileged to have her here at our conference today and as a dedicated member of our PWS community all year round. Dr. Miller? Good morning. All right, so I'm going to present um, some updates and therapies in Potter Willie syndrome. So I decided I should have called this a mishmash because it's a bunch of different topics. Yes? Can you use a mic? I can. Is that better? <laughs> All right. So, um, so we're going to talk about a bunch of different topics, um, growth hormone as well as some other medications that we use in kids with Potter Willie syndrome. So at the University of Florida, we follow over 400 individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome from newborns to adults. My oldest patient is 65 right now. Um, so it's really exciting. We're, my husband always says he's an adult medicine doctor and sees a lot of the adults as well. And always says we're the first generation that's really going to learn the natural history of what happens in adults with Prader-Willi, which is really very cool. So, um, so, and we also study, as Megan said, we study the siblings because we know that your child with Prader Willi is not your child in isolation. They're within your family, and different features come from the context of your family. So this is one of my babies from Chicago. Her mom wanted me to put her picture up because she's so cute. Is she cute? She has a little Toronto thing. So, um, so. Um, we're going to talk briefly about the hypothalamic dysfunction in Prader-Willi syndrome. We're going to go through growth hormone, provisional, and acetylcysteine and some other medications. So before I started this, I realized that I need to, for those of you who haven't heard me talk before, um, to discuss the various nutritional phases that kids with Prader-Willi go through. So most of you have already seen this, but, so you can go to sleep if you want. But, um, but if you haven't seen it, these are the phases that we described. We published this paper in 2011. Um, this was part of the rare disease consortium which stretches across the United States. So we describe phase zero as, which is not up there, as the intrauterine phase. So even in utero, most parents will describe that the kids have decreased fetal movements. 
We know when they're born, they're about 15% lighter in terms of weight and 15% smaller in terms of length than their unaffected siblings. Um, then phase 1A starts at birth, and that's hypotonia with difficulty feeding. This isn't difficulty feeding because they're too weak and they can't suck and swallow. It's difficulty feeding because they actually don't want to eat. So they don't have an appetite. You really, as you all know, being parents of kids with prader willi you have to force feed them during this phase, often with a G-tube or an NG tube or a lot of really hard work feeding them by mouth. Um, in this phase, they can also have failure to thrive despite getting enough calories. Phase 1B typically starts somewhere between 3 and 9 months of age. It's when they have they no longer have difficulty feeding. They grow along their own curve. Some kids in this phase will give satiety signals. They'll tell you when they're hungry. Um, and so it's, it's a pretty normal eating phase that occurs. Um, and they do great during this phase. And then at around 18 months to 36 months, they start a phase called um, phase 2A, which is weight gain without a change in calories. So without changing anything, all of a sudden the weight starts to go up. And if they're fed a typical toddler diet, it continues to go up, but we have, with the help of our excellent nutritionists, um, have developed a diet that helps keep the weight lower for kids in phase 2A. Um, phase 2B is weight increase with an increase in calories. This is when they get more hungry, more interested in food, um, start asking more food-related questions, and want to watch the Food Network, look at cookbooks, that kind of stuff. So they're very aware of food. They'll take food if it's left out within their line of sight and there's no consequence for it. Um, but they're not insatiable. They're still able to feel full. They still will push food away if they don't like it, so they're still picky. Um, and that typically lasts until about um, eight years of age. At eight to nine is the typical age, um, obviously it's got a broad range, of when phase three starts, which is your classic um, phase of prader willi syndrome with the insatiable appetite. and they rarely feel full. So it, it can be anywhere from three years to um, we have a 17-year-old that just went into phase three. So it can it can be a long time before they go in it. Um, but So it's, it's variable, and we're not sure why that variation occurs amongst individuals. And then there is a phase four for adults um, where some of the adults actually then experience a decrease in their appetite again um, and don't feel at, they're no longer insatiable and they don't feel as hungry as they did in phase three. All right, people are taking notes, so I'm going to wait for a second. <laughs> right. So this is the classic growth curve um, for an infant in... Um, I'll have a pointer, sorry. Um, going through phase 1A with the failure to thrive, um, and then 1B where they're growing pretty normally, and then 2A you see the weight start to go up the weight curve. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, is um, the bottom one. And so you can see the weight go up without a change in calories. If left alone, um, the weight will just continue to go up and the individual will develop severe obesity and complications from their obesity. Yes? Yeah, not at all. You can interrupt any time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to double check. Is really most all or all the kids go through that 2A phase where? So, so the answer is yes. However, some parents have the kids on a very healthy diet that's not a typical toddler diet, so they don't, they're not high in carbs, which is a typical toddler diet, and so you don't experience that same weight gain. It still is there, and the metabolism is slower, but you don't experience that significant weight gain. So yes, they go through it, but you may not always see it. But you can see it at times, like if you get out of control, you know, like you're on vacation, the weight will go up. Up, you know, five pounds while you're at Disney World or something, which happens in my study. <laughs> so, um, so it's there, but it, you can you can control it. All right, so to talk just a little bit about the hypothalamic and pituitary abnormalities that occur um, in prader willi syndrome, I divided it up into infancy and early childhood and then later childhood and adulthood. So um, there are two, there's a high level peak of um, a risk for sudden death in individuals with prader willi syndrome. It's in infants and in adults. And we know that some infants with prader willi, about 5 to 10 percent, have central adrenal insufficiency. So they have low ACTH and cortisol levels when they get sick 
that they can't um, mount an appropriate stress hormone response to that illness. So these are kids that often end up in the hospital from a minor thing like a upper respiratory infection. Um, this can also cause hypoglycemia, um, and that may be, even be unrecognized because kids with broader release are... Um, they have hypoglycemic unawareness, if you will. They can't show that they're hypoglycemic like other kids um, do. Um, growth hormone deficiency starts at around six to nine months of age, right when phase 1B typically starts. Um, it occurs in over 90% of individuals with prader willi syndrome. Um, Central hypothyroidism coincides with the start of nutritional phase 2A, so 18 to 24 months um, is the most typical age for this to be diagnosed. It occurs in somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of individuals with Prada Willi. This is really difficult because we know that phase 2A is associated with increased weight gain. Um, and so hypothyroidism is associated with increased weight gain. So you have to be really careful as a parent that your endocrinologist doesn't say, ah, that's just Prada Willi, that's the natural history. You know, the weight gain is going to happen. You do want to have them check the thyroid function to make sure that hypothyroidism is not being missed at this age. Until they hit phase 2B, that's that increased interest and awareness of food. Um, many have a, a normal pain tolerance. They don't have any skin picking or behavioral problems. And they typically have really amazingly excellent sleep patterns. In phase 2B, however, when the anxiety about food and the awareness of food starts to increase, they'll often start to wake up during the night, oftentimes mid, uh, multiple times during the night. Um, they'll wander at night, and then, of course, they have daytime, increased daytime sleepiness because they're not sleeping well at night, um, and possibly they develop increased pain tolerance during this time as well. Um, these kids at, in this phase will start to wake at 4 or 5 in the morning um, and want to get up and play or eat or whatever, you know, just because they're awake. <laughs> um, so in later childhood and adulthood, um, we're going to just talk, uh, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Question here. Sorry, I just have a quick question about your previous slide, because you said to make sure to talk to your endocrinologist about the hypothyroidism to make sure it's not missed. Correct. Is that because there's something they can do about it? Or? Yes, absolutely. There's a medicine that you can give that um, that replaces the thyroid hormone. Okay. So that then you keep the thyroid hormone normal, which okay. helps the metabolism. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So puberty in Prader-Willi is usually characterized by normal pubic hair, axillary hair, um, and acne development. Um, oftentimes this can even occur early, um, earlier than expected. Um, but typically puberty doesn't go all the way through. It, they, they don't complete puberty. They have what we call pubertal arrest, um, which is thought to be due to a combined defect between the hypothalamus and pituitary and the gonads. So there's a dual defect that um, causes the puberty to stop, um, typically around mid puberty um, and they then have what we call hypogonadism so some need sex hormone replacement like testosterone or estrogen um, they can develop central adrenal insufficiency as adults when we looked at our overall population of those with central adrenal insufficiency on average those that had it were about six years older than those that didn't so it can occur um, as the individuals get older um, they do have a high pain tolerance they have a delayed response and reaction to pain and um, and some of them in this phase, um, as most of you know, when the kids are little, they will not typically drink plain water. You can't get them to do it. Um, but when they're in um, phase three, some of them, not all of them, but some of them will drink plain water, and they'll drink enough of it that they can develop water intoxication um, if their fluid intake isn't regulated. So it's something that we watch very closely in adults is how much fluid they're taking in. Um, and as Dr. Tobier mentioned, there are decreased numbers of the anorexia oxygenic oxytocin neurons in their brain on post-mortem studies. So hypothalamic obesity can be caused by a number of things, not just Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, but regardless of the cause, and this is important when we talk about treatments later on, it's an impairment of the regulatory centers of body weight and energy expenditure. So it's a loss of sensitivity to the um, peripheral signals of satiety, such as leptin. So leptin is made in fat tissue. When we have enough fat tissue, leptin is supposed to signal our brain and say, you're fat enough. Stop eating. We don't need to store any more body fat, and you stop. Now, obviously, we can override this signal, but um, but with hypothalamic obesity, there is a resistance. Or, I'm sorry, again, a resistance to these signals. 
Additionally, there's dysfunctional signals um, from the gut as well, including insulin as a, just a hormonal example. Um, in addition, with hypothalamic obesity, energy regulation, as most of you know, which is metabolism, um, by the sympathetic nervous system is deranged, and there's also dysregulation of cortisol metabolism and melatonin. Other evidence that individuals with prader willi have hypothalamic dysfunction um, includes that the hyperphagia and abnormal satiety signals, the fact that they have these multiple endocrinopathies, abnormal circadian rhythm, abnormal pain tolerance, abnormal thirst and metabolism, behavioral problems which can be hypothalamically mediated, and um, autonomic nervous system dysfunction which was just shown by Andrea Hack's study um, in Edmonton, is that where she is? I don't remember where she's, yes. Canada's good, she's in Canada. <laughs> okay, so that's it about the basics. Any questions? Okay, so we're gonna talk about growth hormone. All right, so the first studies of growth hormone were done in the U.S. by uh, Morris Angulo and in, in Sweden by Martin Ritz, and they both did initially just giving growth hormone, so not a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and they showed improvements with growth velocity and body composition. Um, everyone said that's really nice, but you have to have the scientific gold standard, so every, they had to go back and do randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials, and indeed showed that these things do occur with growth hormone treatment in kids with Prader Willi, as they already knew, um, and so it was FDA approved in the U.S. in 2000 for an indication of growth failure with Prader Willi syndrome. I'm going to skip that for a second. Um, most physicians quickly realized, however, that not only children with growth failure with Prader Willi syndrome could benefit from growth hormone, but that everyone with Prader Willi syndrome could probably benefit from growth hormone. So it became really widely accepted in the U.S. to start individuals with Prader Willi on growth hormone regardless of their growth pattern or growth hormone status. Um, it's been used off-label now in the U.S. since 2003 um, for infants, children without growth failure, and adults with Prader Willi, and it has multiple benefits aside from growth. It improves body composition, it decreases the fat mass and increases the muscle mass, it improves bone mineral density, and it improves respiratory parameters. Um, the prevalence of growth hormone deficiency, as I said, is about 90% in children and about 50% in adults. And the reason for this discrepancy is that you don't need as much growth hormone as an adult. You're no longer growing. So the adult standards for growth hormone deficiency are much different than the child standards for growth hormone deficiency. So only about 50% of individuals with Prader Willi will actually qualify as growth hormone deficient when they are adults. Um, I know that there's always been a lot of questions about why some kids respond to a really low dose of growth hormone, some kids need a really high dose of growth hormone to get the same effects, and it's been shown by a group in um, China as well as by um, Merlin Butler's group in Kansas that there are polymorphisms on the growth hormone receptor gene which is on chromosome 15Q um, which influences the final height as well as the response to growth hormone treatment. So this may be some of the reason be for those dose differences between your children. Um, the question always comes up regarding infants. Is it important to treat the infants? And if so, um, you know, why? They're not growth hormone, they're not um, small yet. Um, and the reason is that growth hormone does decrease ghrelin, which as Dr. Tober showed you is high even in the infants. Um, and so it may ultimately alter the natural course of the appetite progression in Prader Willi if you do it very early in life. Um, additionally, it shortens that initial failure to thrive stage with um, Prader Willi um, quite significantly. Significantly. There's been other data from Aaron Carroll's group and Anita Hoken Kolka's group um, that shows that growth hormone treatment of infants does improve IQ scores as well as psychomotor development. We found in our study um, that we do in terms of the um, sibling study, we found that kids treated with growth hormone before age one had a decreased fat mass, um, a lower BMI, and a higher resting energy expenditure when they were nine years old compared to those who were treated after age one. So it definitely made a difference in terms of their fat deposition and metabolism. And so to us that indicated that early treatment with growth hormone may actually help ameliorate some of the obesity that's associated with Prader Willi later on in life. Um, 
IQ does improve with growth hormone therapy. This has been shown by several groups, as I said. Um, interestingly, those with the most severe cognitive delays actually seem to have the most improvement with growth hormone therapy in terms of their response cognitively. And this occurs across all ages. Um, Anita Hokenkolga has just shown that no matter what age you start growth hormone therapy, that it does actually end up improving cognitive scores. Um, we don't know why this is, but there's a couple theories. One is my theory, which is that there are IGF-1 receptors on the neurons in the brain, and so growth hormone actually improves brain growth and development. Another theory is that um, the mice with Prader-Willi, which Rachel will talk about later, um, have hypoglycemia and deficits in insulin secretion when they're in infant mice, um, and growth hormone actually increases both insulin and glucose levels. So it may decrease the prevalence of hypoglycemia in the young infants, and this may be why you see an improvement in cognitive scores. And lastly, we know that growth hormone therapy can attenuate cognitive damage caused by lack of oxygen. And we know that lack of oxygen can be a problem for a lot of young kids with Prader-Willi because of sleep apnea, and so it's unknown if this effect is part of the reason that growth hormone improves cognitive scores as well. So um, I know that all the endocrinologists talk about the risks of growth hormone treatment in Prader-Willi. Um, it's known that there's really no difference in the causes of death um, between those who are treated with growth hormone therapy and those who are not. The major causes of mortality remain the same, um, respiratory insufficiency or, in, or infection, cardiac arrest, sudden unexplained death, choking, and ruptured stomach. Um, premature death peaks, as I said, in early infancy and in adulthood and seems to be increased more in the males. Um, obesity is a factor in most of the adult-related deaths. Um, therefore, we do need to be cautious when we're starting growth hormone, especially for infants um, and adults because of this um, increased risk of um, sudden death. Um, and we monitor very closely, especially during times of respiratory infection in these groups. Um, other issues, scoliosis is, is often raised by endocrinologists if your child has scoliosis. Can they be on growth hormone therapy? The answer is yes. Um, there's no evidence at all that growth hormone causes or exacerbates scoliosis, um, no matter what the age that treatment is initiated. Um, diabetes is another risk factor that endocrinologists will talk about, and this is a risk factor. As I said, it does increase insulin and glucose levels. However, it's mostly the, in, in those who are massively obese or who have a family history of diabetes. Um, respiratory problems, of course, um, are an issue that has been discussed a lot. Um, we do sleep studies on all our kids um, before starting growth hormone therapy, and um, as well as about six to eight weeks after starting growth hormone therapy, and ask the kids to be followed by an ENT um, or a GI doctor. A lot of the infants have reflux that causes obstructive sleep apnea, um, so that we can adequately treat whatever's causing their sleep apnea, and therefore be allowed to continue the growth hormone therapy. We don't want to stop it because of these problems. We just want to treat the problems. Um, and then sudden death. And again, there's considerable evidence that indicates that the risk of sudden death is um, the same with or without. Yes, Tanya. Hi. Um, when Dante was about 13 months, um, he had started GH, and then at 15 months, his tonsils and adenoids grew, so they asked him to stop the GH, and then we went and I had both of them removed and then went back on it. Is that the right kind of protocol? Um, we actually don't stop it. We okay. continue it um, and just they get their tonsils and adenoids removed if that's necessary. So, so it doesn't really have to do with one another? Well, growth hormone grows things, okay. including lymphoid tissue. So it does, growth hormone can cause growth of the tonsils and adenoids, and that's been shown in other kids um, that are treated with IGF-1. So we know that IGF-1 itself is what causes that growth, and so it is, it is related, and that's that's why we say either a GI or an ENT doctor needs to follow the kids, or both. Um, because that can happen, and it's actually fairly common. And if they ask um, if the uh, doctor wants to take them off GH, mm -hmm. then it's basically per endo's decision as to whether they feel comfortable. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thank you.
So um, as many of you may have experienced as your kids are getting older, um, once the kids enter nutritional phase 2A where their metabolism slows down and they start to gain weight more easily, their IGF-1 levels seem to increase without a change in their growth hormone dose. So without doing anything, all of a sudden the IGF-1 levels go high. Um, this causes a lot of endocrinologists to bring down the growth, dose of growth hormone quite significantly and some even to stop it because of these high levels. Um, high IGF-1 levels are theoretically associated with an increased risk in certain cancers, um, such as prostate cancer or colon cancer. Um, and so that's why they're recommending bringing it down because of this theoretical risk from the high IGF-1 levels. Um, however, it has been shown that, that lowering the IGF-1 levels and lowering the dose of growth hormone actually does somewhat decrease the positive effects of the treatment. So we try, if we have to lower it to keep the IGF-1 levels within a reasonable range, um, within two standard deviations of the normal range, then we do so. But we we want it to still be, um, you know, normal. We don't want to drop the dose of growth hormone or stop it to the point where your IGF-1 levels drop down into the lower part of the normal range because you lose those positive benefits. Um, in adults, it's been shown that IGF-1 levels correlate with self-assessment of quality of life, IQ, and appetite assessment. So to me, these are really important things, and that's why we don't want to stop it um, or lower it too much. Um, and right now, we're doing research in our sibling study to correlate IGF-1 levels in early childhood with outcomes in terms of later childhood, in terms of cognitive score, body composition, and metabolism. There have been 10 studies that have been done with growth hormone treatment in adults with Prader-Willi. Um, as I said, the growth hormone response is low at about 50%. Nonetheless, um, they both, whether or not they have growth hormone deficiency, they do get benefit from growth hormone therapy as adults. Um, in the U.S., every adult with Prader-Willi has to be tested with a stimulation test, a growth hormone stimulation test, much like you have to do here in Canada for every person who's going to go on growth hormone. Um, and you can't get growth hormone as an adult adult with Prader-Willi unless you fail that stimulation test. Um, in Europe, it's approved um, based on quality of life, or it can be approved based on quality of life issues, but in the U.S., um, you definitely have to fail the growth hormone stim test, which means that up to 50% of adults are going to end up being off growth hormone as adults, which is concerning. Um, there have been eight studies evaluating the results, or the results of growth hormone treatment in adults with Prader-Willi. Um, the most common side effect of growth hormone treatment was swelling, and particularly of the lower legs. Insulin and glucose levels did increase, as I said, but diabetes did not increase, so that wasn't really a risk. Um, a few patients had a headache, um, some muscle aches, but in general they did really well and had improvement in body composition, improvement in lean muscle mass, um, and improvement in quality of life. Um, in adults with Prader-Willi, the contraindications to growth hormone therapy are morbid obesity um, and severe untreated obstructive sleep apnea. The adults also showed improvement in mental speed and flexibility, um, as well as motor performance, which is very important. Um, when the growth hormone was stopped, the parents reported that there was an overall decrease in the physical and social status and the overall functioning of the adult with Prader-Willi. Um, and they reported an improvement in self-control um, and vitality when the adults were on growth hormone therapy. Any questions about growth hormone? Hey Jen, I have a question. I'm loud, so I don't need a microphone. What, uh, what other studies do you think we need in the medical literature to prove the efficacy of growth hormone in adults, even the ones that fail the stem test? I think you're, you're going to need more double-blind placebo-controlled trials in adults showing that regardless of the growth hormone stim test result, that there's still benefit to treating um, with growth hormone therapy. For a lot of the adults, I can use the diagnosis of panhypopituitarism because they have multiple hormonal deficits, and that you don't have to have a stim test for, but if the insurance company sees the words prader willi then they, they balk and they say, you, have, you must have a stem test. Um, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, but, so I think that's what, there's only been two double-blind um, randomized placebo-controlled trials. Um, and I think there's going to need to be more um, and probably done in the U.S.
Can you just remind me or, and everyone what um, a high level of IGF-1 would be? Or, like, what is the range? Uh, no, I can't because no. the ranges are different <laughs> for every lab. Um, and the ranges also are different depending on your age, your sex, your tanner stage, your bone age. So, um, so it's different for every um, person. Case. So then when your endo is taking... Um, the IGF, like blood tests and taking the IG or uh, monitoring the IGF one levels. Um, what, so they're just basing on what their level was prior to it increasing. Yeah, it's actually like a normal range. So, you know, the labs will print yes. out a normal range, and you, as the endocrinologist, then take, you know, what you know about that child, their bone age, their sex, their, um, you know, pubertal status, and you say, okay, this child is, you know, this, and therefore their IGF-1 normal range should be this, and then you compare it to what their IGF-1 actually is. And so then when you said two standard deviations above the normal range, so then if they are falling just <laughs> if they're falling just um, like still within the normal range but high, then you're even looking for two more standard deviations above that normal range before anything? Treating to get there, but that's what happens is that you see them bump up. Um, and so we're just recommending um, not decreasing the dose too significantly. I guess I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm prepared when knowing that Claire's IGF one levels are getting a little bit, not high, high, but higher, that if it's recommended that the dose gets lower, I want to make sure that it's not just because they're getting a little bit higher. Do you see what I mean? going to happen, usually. So, right. I mean, I don't want to speak for your endocrinologist, but that's pretty typical that that's what happens. They get a little bit higher, and they're above the normal range, and then the endocrinologist asks you to pull it back down. So, um, and, and we don't recommend that unless they're really high above the normal okay. range. All right, right. Fair statement? Okay. <laughs> Can I uh, ask an added question to that? Um, Dr. Biller, one of the things we saw with Chloe when we brought her for your study was that her IGH-1 levels were at F1 levels were quite high, which surprised you, given her size and right. her profile. Um, and you mentioned to me, and I think a lot of people in the room are aware of this, but maybe you could talk a bit more about the diet and the effect of, you know, a high concentration of carbohydrates in the diet and what effect it has on those levels. Right. So high insulin levels um, also can be measured as high IGF-1 levels. And so high insulin in young kids with Prader-Willi is driven by carbohydrates. A high carbohydrate meal will increase their insulin secretion from the pancreas pretty dramatically um, for the, their degree of weight. Um, so, in other words, a typical lean child of the same age would produce a much smaller amount of insulin in response to the carbohydrates, whereas a kid with Prader-Willi will have a really robust insulin response in, um, in response to those carbohydrates being taken in in the diet. So, we've seen that if you decrease the carbs in the diet, um, especially the simple carbs, then the IGF-1 level will will go down um, just simply with that change alone, without um, changing the growth hormone dose. And Tanya, I'm going to make you talk, even though you're not paying attention. What did Dante's levels go down from? And oh, do <laughs> I'm always paying attention to you, Jennifer. <laughs> So um, they actually went down quite a bit. So we um, came to see Jennifer in May. We did the SIP study, which is fabulous, by the way. I can't, I can't tell you how amazing it was for both of us. I mean, we learned that Denzel had some deficiencies, our younger son, that we never would have found if we didn't go to the study. So that, that was great. Um, <laughs> um, we don't have to sell your SIP study anymore, though, because people are lining up and you're probably... Um, but anyways, we found in May we came and his levels were, were um, really high. And so we, and that week, of course, we were eating out. We had a lot of carbs that week because we were in Orlando and on vacation. And then we came back home. We got them retested just to make sure, and they were still really high. Then I saw Jennifer in November at the PWSA conference and said, what's going on? And she said, well, watch the carbs. So for, we did two weeks. We limited the carbs and went and had the GH testing done again, and they were right back under the high level. So they're they're perfect now. Like 200 points. Yes, I mean, it, it was, was huge. Really significant, yeah. yeah. So it, the diet does play a role. Uh, oh, Matt, we're gonna make you run again. <laughs> How did you do the 
it be a once a year thing or I test kids every time I see them um, so it, well if they're not growing well or if I have any concerns I'll test them every time I see them but I would say at least once every six months it should be done if you have an adult child with Prader Willi once a year is probably adequate don't you think for adults so every six months they should get the blood work done to make sure the levels are good. correct okay. exactly okay thank you Anything else? Oh, more. Some <laughs> say some say to stop it when they're sick, and some say don't. Right. And what's your every endocrinologist has their own individual comfort level as to whether or not they feel that the growth hormone is a risk when the child is sick. So if you can imagine, you know, I said to Tanya, growth hormone grows in the tonsil snatinoids, right? So your child already has a narrow airway because they have Prader Willi syndrome. So they have a small chin, they have a narrower airway. You got big tonsil snatinoids in there from the growth hormone therapy, and then you get a stuffy nose. Right. What's going to happen? They're going to obstruct because they're not going to have, I mean, they're going to have a teeny tiny little airway. So some endocrinologists feel more comfortable stopping the growth hormone during an illness like that to avoid the tonsil synadenoids being as enlarged. Um, some don't. If your child's had their tonsils and adenoids out already, then it's really not a risk. Um, so they don't, they shouldn't have to worry about it as much, but that's the risk and that's why they're worried about it. It's typically with upper respiratory infections more than anything. So if they already have their tonsils and adenoids out, the risk is, even if, like my daughter, she's on BiPAP and uh -huh. like sleep apnea, it's not as big a deal what, if the tonsils are gone. And the yeah, exactly. And on BiPAP or CPAP, you're safe anyway. You don't ever have to stop. So. <laughs> If the IGF-1 level does go too high and you decide to decrease, de to decrease it, do you just do it by like 0.2 and just keep testing every month? So I know that you do our dosing, but just so it wouldn't go from like, like Leah's on one milligram the whole way down to like 0.4. It would not. Okay, perfect. If I have anything to do with it. Yes, you will. <laughs> All right. Yep. I just wanted to go back to uh, the when you spoke about uh, the central adrenal insufficiency. Um, I'm not sure. Did you uh, were the numbers much different than what uh, the percentage of kids that have it? Is it? What, did you say five to ten percent? Yeah, that's what you're finding too, right? About that, yeah. So it's not the sixty percent. That it's not the sixty percent that was originally published, and it's not zero percent because there's been three subsequent papers that were published that said that it doesn't exist in right. Prader Willi syndrome. We know it exists. Mm -hmm. The kids often have clinical signs of it, um, excessive fatigue, although that's pretty common in Prader Willi syndrome. Anyway, um, hypoglycemia, like I said, a really severe response to a pretty minor illness. Um, um, and so when we've looked, it looks like to be about 10% of individuals with Prader Willi have okay. central adrenal insufficiency. And what do you think about um, uh, an endocrinologist who wants to sort of preventatively treat for it? Is that? That's what you do, right? So if, if oh, here, here, give, the, give Dr. Tober the microphone real quick, because I want her to tell what they do in France. <laughs> 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 No, we, we, we are not uh, supplementing every, every child, but if we find a very low cortisol level, we treat it uh -huh. constantly. And if we have some, you know, some fear of something occurs or some particular patients, yes, we treat them during an uh, upper way. Uh, we, we, we use uh, insulin, yes. So, um, but, you're, but you are giving supplemental hydrocortisone to your patients to have just in case, correct? But no, only, uh, only, only those, the ones that no, you're only the 10% we yeah. have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Other treatments? This is my more fun part. All right. Um, so um, 
recently I submitted a paper with our um, speech and language pathologist um, where we were looking at the prevalence of apraxia and prader willi syndrome. Many of you may have dealt with apraxia. It's a motor speech planning disorder. Um, it's where kids can't sequence words well. Um, they often have problems getting words out. Um, and we found that, um, that about 40% of individuals with prader willi do have apraxia. It seemed to be more common in the kids who had type 1 deletions, so the bigger deletions. And we think this is because there is a gene in those four base, or those four um, genes, one of the, in that area where there's four other genes, um, one of those genes is affected, um, affects speech and language. So we think that's why the bigger deletions tend to be more affected um, than the smaller deletions. Um, I just wanted to mention this because our speech and language pathologist uses a technique that's called tactile cueing. She has them tap out words and slide out words um, with their hands, on their arms, on their chest, yeah, like Rhea's doing back there. Um, and, um, and this works beautifully for apraxia. So so if your child does have apraxia or you're worried about your child having apraxia, this is a technique to mention to your speech and language therapist um, because it, it does work well. Yes. It is prompt therapy, yes. Uh -huh. Um, also, the other thing I just wanted to mention here is that that kind of tactile learning also seems to help with learning letters and numbers and more abstract concepts. Um, so we encourage teachers to give the kids Play-Doh to make letters out of or trace them in the sand or have some sort of tactile feedback when they're learning some of these more abstract concepts. And that's Sarah, by the way, at the bottom, who has Prada Willie, and she's 13 and um, doesn't have an increased appetite and is a cheerleader for her school, so she reminds me much of Olivia. <laughs> all right, that's all I got on speech and language. Does anybody have any questions? I'm so not a speech and language person. <laughs> all right, OCD. Um, many individuals, as you know, with Prada Willie have obsessive compulsive um, and rigid behaviors. Over 60% of the individuals in our study, in our sibling study, um, collect, organize, arrange items compulsively and often will spend over an hour every day um, engaging in these behaviors. Um, there is some question as to whether or not some of the eating issues in Prada Willie are um, compulsions as much as they are hyperphagia. So um, I was saying this morning to a group at breakfast that, you know, sometimes an adult will be sitting there and they'll be eating their lunch and they'll say, I can't believe you're feeding me this, Dr. Miller. I really hate this. It's disgusting. I don't want to eat it. But they're they're eating it because they're that's their routine. They eat what's put in front of them. So um, there may be some aspect of compulsion to the eating as well. Um, skin picking and nail biting, um, I consider compulsions as well. Um, for a lot of individuals with Prader Willi syndrome, and as you know, these are fairly common in Prader Willi as well. Some of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors work to decrease the obsessive compulsive behaviors. Um, Elizabeth Roof and Elizabeth Dykins at Vanderbilt have done a lot of study on this, and they found that Celexa and Lexapro, those are the, the brand names, um, tend to be the best in terms of reducing the OCD and the anxiety associated with OCD um, with Prader Willi syndrome. And then this is my new favorite supplement it's N acetylcysteine. Um, it, has, it was published initially for treatment of trichotillomania where individuals pull out their own hair and we found that it does work for skin picking and nail biting in kids with Prader Willi as well. It affects glutamate levels in the brain making it easier to stop that unwanted behavior. Do you want more on n acetylcysteine first or you want me to go backwards? Uh, more on n acetylcysteine. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I have um, uh, an eight-year-old daughter with Prader Willi syndrome and she is uh, compulsively pulling out, twirling and pulling out her hair. We keep her hair clipped very short and um, and she still has massive bald patches. So um, I did have someone tell me about this but we haven't tried it yet and how do you figure out the dose? I guess. Um, I, I guess, really don't, yeah. Uh, it's a, again, that's really scientific, right? It causes either 500 or 600 milligram tablets. And um, and so you start with one. If it doesn't work, you go to two. You really don't want to go above 2,000 milligrams a day because that's the max dose that's been tried in research studies thus far. Um, but you can increase it to the level of effectiveness. So Megan can tell you from experience that she self-increased and it worked um, to stop Chloe's skin picking. Um, so it's really um, a quite remarkable um, supplement. And so you would just get that at the health food store. Okay, and one more question about it. 
which is, oh, so when you start it, when you say, like, increase till it's effective, how long would you wait? Like, a couple weeks. Oh, that long. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, um, oh, yes. Does that work for any, you had said 60% do the sorting or arranging. Yeah, have you found that it worked for, for that? Looked. You haven't, haven't looked. looked but, um, is it no. no, it's not. Okay. It's a very safe supplement. So, so it might work. Um, so feel free to experiment and let me know okay. if, you, if it works. I will. Um, but, you know, as you probably know, I mean, the skin picking is, um, is a big problem and it's disgusting. And so you want to get rid of it. And so that's why we're doing it because that's a really big problem for a lot of kids and a lot of families because they'll get secondary infections and, um, and it can be just really a mess. Um, whereas the compulsive sorting and arranging and that kind of stuff, it's, it can be annoying. But it's not life altering. Yeah, you know, if that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Are there comments? Should there be any cautions in terms of uh, interaction with uh, other medications, or is it? You know, I'm not aware of any other interactions with other medications, but it probably is worth looking. Um, I've typically been doing this in, in younger kids, so they're really not on much medicine. Um, in adults who would be on more medicines, um, I, I would definitely check with a physician to make sure that there are no drug interactions. Thank you. Thanks for being patient with a microphone. I, I joke every year, and me running around is not my inner Phil Donahue or Orlando. It's just so that the people watching live and for the YouTube clips, we can hear their question clearly. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so like I was saying, that this, this medication actually influences the reward and reinforcement pathway. So it makes it easier to stop the behavior because you don't get the positive reward and reinforcement from doing the behavior that you otherwise get. Um, there's been some studies looking at the effects of N-acetylcysteine on psychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, as well as other psychiatric disorders associated with a, um, impulsive or compulsive um, symptoms like trichotillomania, pathological nail biting, gambling, substance abuse. Um, further research needs to be done to see if these medications will help, like I said, with the compulsivity if eating is part of, is, is a compulsion, some of it, um, as they get older. Um, I will tell you that it does not work for cocaine abusers. There was a study. Doesn't fix that. Just saying. <laughs> All right. Um, Sleep issues is the next thing I want to talk about. Tell you, did you have a question? Thanks, thanks, Phil. Um, the, I know you had a list of, of issues that that would address that medication or that, that supplement. And uh, is repetitive questioning on that list? I'm sorry, I didn't. It wasn't. Um, but that's okay. also something um, interesting to think about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> because that is a big compulsion yeah. for a lot of kids. Um, Perfect. So, yeah, very interesting. I don't know. But if you guys want to experiment, let me know. Um, and like I said, it's pretty safe, especially for young kids who are not on other medications. So, um, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep giving it if it doesn't work. You know, I would, I would try it and see. But it definitely seems to help for skin picking for a lot of individuals. Yes, sir. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Thanks. <laughs> With the sleep disruption, I'm just wondering, our child is uh, two and a half, she's on BiPAP at night. I'm doing pretty well with it. Um, do we see a decrease in the waking in the middle of the night if they're on BiPAP and CPAP? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that was an excellent segue into talking about sleep issues. So, um, as you know, sleep issues are common with um, kids with prader willi Often, as infants, they have excessive daytime sleepiness, um, but not all have excessive daytime sleepiness, but it definitely is a fairly common finding. Um, and at age two to three is when they really start to wake up very early in the morning, um, have sleep onset dreams, the REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep, um, and abnormal sleep cycles with a lot of nocturnal arousals. And you can catch this on sleep study or you can as a parent know that empirically this happens to your child that they're not sleeping normally. Um, 
this is because I'm talking about treatments for kids with Prader-Willi. I just wanted to mention that for this, um, melatonin extended release formulation tends to be working well for a lot of these kids who are waking up um, during the middle of the night. Um, melatonin itself doesn't work because it, that puts you to sleep. And kids with Prader-Willi in general don't have a problem going to sleep. It's staying asleep that's the problem. So the extended release tends to help um, maintain the sleep through the night. Um, yes. No, it's okay. So our eight-year-old daughter, she has significant sleep issues. Um, we're trying to get her to wear CPAP, and that's been a real behavioral issue more than anything, um, with very little result yet. But we were not able to give her the extended release melatonin because it comes only, or at least here, it was only available in a pill form that can't be chewed, crushed, or broken. So, and she d won't swallow a pill. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I've never run into that problem before. Really? So, um, there's no other suggestion that that's the only form it comes in that you know of as well, okay. Yeah, it is. We'll work on the pill thing. Yeah, work on the pill thing. Hide it in something. Yogurt? Yeah, yogurt works well. She finds it and spits it out. That's pretty interesting. So, yeah, because, uh-huh. In terms of getting the children to take the pills, that our son gets the rest of his meal after he has his medicine. And, um, uh, you know, he looks at the food and uh, on the counter and said, you know, we'll wait if you want to wait, you know, sit here for an hour or so and then have lunch at 1 o'clock or 1.30, that's okay, we'll sit here with you. And, uh, and, after, uh, and after one or two days of that, uh, you know, he complains, but then he says, uh, he somehow he managed to take the pills and if he ever protests, then it's just, that's fine, we'll just wait. He just always has the medicine before uh, he does what he wants, which is eat. I like it. Uh-huh. Yes, at night right before bed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. um, my son, we went to um, the Vanderbilt study, and he was having, this is like a mul multiple question in one. <laughs> One question. With yeah, right. Parts. He was having behavioral issues, of course, you know, with temper tantrums, and he's always been able to sleep through the night till seven. Well, she, within five or ten minutes, said, you know, she saw some ADD tendencies. She put him on Concerta, mm -hmm. and ever since he's been on this Concerta, um, he's turned down lunch. He's sleeping into ten o'clock. Mm -hmm. His temper tantrums are. Obsolete. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this with the stimulant? I have. And that also was an excellent introduction into our next discussion, which is narcolepsy cataplexy, which includes the stimulant medications. So it's interesting. Most of the stimulant medications do cause side effects in kids with prader but it's it's beautiful that you've had um, success with it. And some of the younger kids do have success with some of those long-acting um, stimulant medications. So it's, it's possible. It's possible. But enjoy it. <laughs> um, oh, there's Dante. Tanya, right there. <laughs> um, so, so... As many of you may or may not have seen, narcolepsy symptoms are present in childhood and in prader -Willi, and often they manifest during eating, which is really fascinating. Orexin is a hormone that's made in the hypothalamus that's low in people with narcolepsy, and in, there's been a study that studied four adults with prader -Willi and found it to be low in the spinal fluid of these few adults with prader -Willi. Low levels of orexin are associated with a lower metabolic rate and increased ease of weight gain, which, as you know, are problems in kids with prader -Willi. Mice who have declining levels of orexin actually have significant weight gain and decreased energy and activity levels without a change in their food or anything else. Um, orexin, the gene for orexin and its receptor are not on chromosome 15, so the fact the fact that it can be possibly deficient in prader -Willi, um, may be, is probably due to the hypothalamic dysfunction in prader -Willi. 
Okay, so I'm showing you two videos. This is Madeline. Yes, so you see her eating and there she falls asleep. Um, this is fairly common. Interestingly, I think this starts right around phase 2A beginning, um, which would make sense, right? That, um, that if their erexin declines, they get more tired, they gain weight easier, um, and you'll see these narcoleptic tendencies. And then often, most kids, um, if you have older kids, you know that your kids outgrew this um, over time, and it's not as severe once they get a little bit older. This is Joshua. Um, Joshua has cataplexy, so a little bit different. Um, you can see here his mom's playing with him, and you see him laughing, and then watch. Down he goes. So, um, so the, it's it, both narcolepsy and cataplexy can be present in the Prader Willi population. Uh -huh. So it's not just the closing of the eyes, it's they actually fall asleep. They actually fall asleep. Trance, yeah. We think it's actual sleep. We think it's actual sleep. Um, and when you take the food away, what happens? She wakes up. Yeah. Very much aware. Yes. Closing your eyes and like, this is nice. I'm enjoying this. Right. But it's like completely awake. Uh huh. And I think she's asleep. I do. Um, we've talked, my sleep specialist and I have talked a lot about trying to put EEG leads on their heads when they're doing that to see if that's actually sleep. Because some of them, like that little girl, um, you know, you can see that it's sleep. Their head falls down, you know. Um, but others, that's a very common behavior. And we think that's sleep also. We think that's narcolepsy. Yes, absolutely. It's very common. Uh, Dante just had a sleep study about a month ago, and um, the, we just got a phone call the other day saying that um, he went into REM sleep a little too quickly for their liking. So what does that mean? That means that he probably has narcolepsy. Okay. So, um, which means um, that ProVigil may be helpful for him to answer your next question. I, you knew I was going to ask that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so Cade has cataplexy. So would you say that that's different than when he's eating and just relaxing and... I, I think he's got both. I'm okay. looking at the video, which I was going to put on here too because I knew you were going to be here, but it's sideways and I can't make it stand up um, because I'm not technically gifted. Um, but, um, but I think that he's got both. I think he's okay. got narcolepsy and got Because when he eats, uh -huh. he... He gets does. in that relaxed yeah. state, but then I can bring it on by making him laugh, and he'll do the head yeah, drops. And drop. yeah. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, another quick question. But to kind of go off of what Tanya was saying um, about, we had the same thing with Claire. They called and said... She went into REM sleep too quickly, but still within the normal ranges, I suppose they were saying, like, because we were, we had a discussion and they were saying that all of us could kind of do that at once in a while. And so they're going to wait and test her again. Should we not wait? Like, should we just... So there's another test that can be done called an MSLT, which is a multiple sleep latency test. And what they do is they put her in a room, they turn off the lights five times, and they see if she goes into REM sleep when they do that. Um, Okay. Um, and so that actually is the diagnostic test for narcolepsy. So, um, so I would probably. So should we put? Would you push that? Like because they were just like, oh well, we'll just see what happens next year. You suspect that she that she has problems with daytime sleepiness and potentially narcolepsy, then I would say yes, it would it would be worth doing. I mean, she's never fallen asleep per se, but if you think that that closing of the eyes is actually sleep, then okay, just yeah. Um, it's called an MSLT. So everybody knows we're live, and there's a few questions that actually came from around the world. I, I can't, I don't know exactly where, but one question is for you, Dr. Miller. Um, is caffeine something that we should try as well? Yes, I actually use caffeine in the younger kids. Um, and a lot of the older kids have actually gotten by on caffeine quite well. Doing a cup of coffee or two in the morning um, seems to really help their alertness during the day as well. Um, so that's a more natural approach to doing it than a medication. One more question online. Um, Dr. Miller, 
how common are eye problems and when do they typically resolve? When um, are we, is, is it appropriate to proceed with surgery? So eye, com eye problems are very common. Um, it, I, I'm so not an ophthalmologist, um, and so I really can't answer that question. Um, but if they don't seem to be improving, most of the op ophthalmologists are doing the surgery before age two um, to prevent uh, to prevent loss of bifocal vision because there's apparently a problem if it lasts if you wait till longer than age two in terms of their depth perception and stuff. So, um, but that's all I know. I don't know much about eye problems. And one more question. Could someone reiterate the age, so do age or dose that was mentioned for uh, melatonin? Um, the age is any age um, that they're waking up during the night. And the dose typically based on their weight um, when they're that age, I, I usually use two or three milligrams. Last question, I'm sorry. Could you talk about children and, and O2 needs and how long typically do they need um, su supplements? Supplemental oxygen probably. Right, right. Yeah. So, and, it's, and it's very variable for every child. So, you know, some kids do need supplemental oxygen, some kids do not, most do not. Um, but for those that do, um, it's, it's extremely variable how long they need it for, whether they need it all day and all night or just during the night. Um, and so there's no, there's no rule there. It is very child dependent. Rhea would like to ask a question now. <laughs> I want to go back to the narcolepsy thing for a minute. Um, uh, okay, well, I have a question anyway. I still have a question. Um, it, would you consider a, a child who falls asleep like that in the car, wakes up for, like, to speak and say a few things and then immediately falls back to sleep? Is that narcolepsy? Could be. So you need to. So you would do the test. You would get the test done and then perhaps get prescribed provisional in which I'm going to talk about yeah, I know. In <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly so yeah I would have the test done if you're concerned that's that's the gold standard and especially in Canada um, because I know that it's harder to get certain medications here um, you know in the US I can prescribe provisional which we'll talk about in a minute um, with no problem but um, in other places you really uh, oftentimes have to prove the diagnosis of narcolepsy which is proven by that MSL T test. Is it possible that we would have to see a specialist? I guess you wouldn't know this, a, a pulmonologist, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily have to see like a neurologist or somebody who does an EEG. It can be any pulmon yeah, any, a pulmonologist who, who does sleep studies. Okay, thanks. Which is most. <laughs> I'm not perfectly English, so I'm going to try my best, and um, I hope my question is uh, okay. Um, Narrocleopsy? <laughs> Oh, do you speak French primarily? It's okay, I can speak English. Oh, okay, I was going to say you could talk and Dr. Tober could translate. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about uh, they, keep, they go to sleep when they eat? Uh-huh. <laughs> I was thinking about my son that when I feed him, uh -huh. uh, he goes to sleep often when I try to feed him. Uh -huh. And after that, I put him away, uh -huh. and he's all awake. And is that? Is that it's, it's truly amazing. It's it's really it's really remarkable um, how how that happens. And the first time I ever saw this, I was watching a little girl eat Cheerios, and she was just all you know. And I was trying to figure out is she really enjoying those Cheerios or what's going on. And as soon as her dad said, "We're all done," up from the chair and away she went, you know, running and playing. Um, and it was just such a dramatic change. And I, I was like, there's something wrong. You know, there's something that's not normal there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's very commonly what you see, is that the food is gone, the sleepiness is gone. So it could be in phase 2A? Correct. Possibly. Uh, but, but babies, is he a baby, your son? Eight months. Yeah, so babies do that too. So we don't know, um, you know, where across the childhood the, or adulthood that the erection levels um, get low, if low. So we're, gonna, we're um, about to um, start a study to look at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So one last thing on Orexin, and then I'll go. Um, Orexin, recombinant Orexin has been made. It exists. So if we do find that those Orexin levels are low, um, then we could potentially give it to children with Prader-Willi who have low Orexin levels and increase their metabolism because Orexin um, increases brown adipose tissue, the metabolically active fat, which is the good fat, um, and increases metabolism and thereby um, also regulates the sleep cycle and daytime alertness. All right, provisional. You happy? <laughs> Um, so as I was saying earlier, most of the typical stimulants that um, doctors will prescribe for kids with increased daytime sleepiness or narcolepsy um, do have adverse effects in kids with Prader-Willi. We've seen some really severe um, worsening of skin picking. We've seen some really significant ticks on um, the stimulants to the point where the kids are actually hurting themselves because they'll tick and their head will fall down on their desk or whatever. Um, so if you have a child that's on a typical stimulant and doing well, I think that's great, but in general we do see some problems with the typical stimulants. Provisional works well. Dr. Tobera published a study um, two years ago, um, you know, about two years ago, um, on Provigil in, in children with Prader-Willi syndrome and showed that it was safe and effective for individuals with Prader-Willi. Um, it's a stimulant, but it's not a typical stimulant. Um, so it has a little bit of a different mechanism of action. Um, interestingly, one of the things that we tried was giving Provigil prior to therapies um, and saw that the kids were able to attend to the therapies better and so actually got more out of doing the therapies by having the Provigil before they went to the therapy, um, and it also helps in school with paying attention in school and decreasing the daytime sleepiness. It can robustly activate um, the executive function areas of your brain, um, and it um, activates the network of parts of your brain that are involved in higher cognitive functioning and arousal, so it's possible that it could even potentially improve cognitive scores, although we do not know that yet. Um, now, Provigil does carry a black box warning, um, but there is a risk of severe allergic reaction and rash in young children, so, um, so nowadays when I prescribe Provigil, I have to check off the box that yes, I am aware that it does carry this black box warning, and I've discussed it with the parents, um, but the rash is really severe and can be deadly, but also can occur with a thousand other drugs, so it's just something to be aware of. Yes, now. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm way over. But we're asking you questions. It's because of the questions. Um, I wanted to double check. Uh, so with the provigil, you said you were giving it before therapies and you were seeing a great improvement. Is that something, Is how long acting is it? Is that something you would... It's 24 hours. Okay. Um, it lasts for 24 hours, but it seems like it, like it starts working about 15 minutes. So it seems like for okay. parents give it. You know, so you can you can more attribute it to that as opposed to having give, given it in the morning. It may still have a good effect. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. A question. Oops. Sorry. Question over here. First me. Um, are there any long-term side effects from using Provigil? Like, is it something we're aware of? Okay. Right. Oh, Mike Hogg. <laughs> I love the running. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering about dose um, in an adult. My, my daughter was on. I remember. Yeah, you know, and and she did. Uh, you know, we communicated. She did marvelously because she has a, a, a real severe narcolepsy and, and cataplexy. She was a different person, uh, but she had the side effect of severe jaw stiffness and it, and it produced uh, some very severe facial grimacing. She's off it. I'm, I'm wondering if there's sort of a minimum kind of therapeutic dose. She's 40 years old. She's 5 feet. She's uh, 108 pounds. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if it's worth another try at a smaller dose. It's very possible that it's worth another try at a smaller dose. You know, maybe start with 50 milligrams um, and see how she does with it. Or you could even try New Vigil, which is a different formulation of the same medication, um, and that may not have those same effects. Or, or with the ProVigil, start at 50 and then, and then just see up a little bit. Okay, exactly. thank you. Mm -hmm. Susan has a question. <laughs> All right. I'll come back. I'll come back. All right, all the children are hungry, so I'm going to go fast. Um, who's the specialist that we need to talk to in order to get a prescription, and at what age do we start looking into it? The pediatrician can prescribe it. Um, <laughs> she's like, I'm done. That's the end of the day. Stop listening. Um, your pediatrician can 
can prescribe it if they feel comfortable with it. Um, a pulmonologist, a neurologist, those are the typical people that prescribe it. Double check. Um, when at any age, I mean, I've started some really young kids on it recently. Uh -huh. right, do you guys want to hear about appetite regulating medications? <laughs> One more question. You may have to limit the question. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, Okay. I'll just do that. Yeah. She's, she's talking. <laughs> we, we have one more question. This gentleman's been waiting patiently. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. So, do I need a prescription for the melatonin XR and the N? No. No. Not the OTC. It's yep. It's over the counter. Perfect. Oh, yeah. sorry. Over the counter. <laughs> all right. All right. So I'm going to quickly go through appetite regulating medications. All right, so the appetite issues are very complex in Prader-Willi, um, involving both the hypothalamic and pituitary dysfunction, as well as dysfunction of the hormones that come from the gut, and that's just kind of a picture of how complex it is. Um, the first medication I'm going to talk about is metformin. Some of your children are on metformin. It's a medication that's commonly used to treat type 2 diabetes. Um, it's used to prevent type 2 diabetes in kids with insulin resistance and glucose intolerance. In the hypothalamus, metformin actually actually has the action of decreasing ghrelin-induced food intake. So as Dr. Tobert talked about, ghrelin is high in Prader-Willi, and so potentially metformin could decrease um, the, the food intake associated with that high ghrelin level. Additionally, metformin activates an enzyme in fat tissue um, that causes decrease in body fat and improvement in weight loss. It's the only diabetes medicine that does actually cause weight loss. Um, right now, one of our GI fellows is doing a study looking at whether or not metformin actually affects um, the hypothalamus and the reward value of food and whether or not it will improve satiety in individuals with Prader-Willi. This is what we saw when we looked at Elizabeth Dykin's hyperphagia questionnaire. Um, both individuals with Prader-Willi and those with other causes of obesity had improvements in their total scores on the hyperphagia questionnaire, so, um, so less hyperphagia on metformin. Additionally, there were some um, significant improvements um, in their time getting upset over food, thinking about food, talking about food, um, and also they were more likely, much more likely, to report leaving food on their plate or feeling full. So some of the parents will tell me for the first time, you know, my child brought home some of their lunch, you know, which they had never done before. So it's pretty impressive information, and we're still investigating more about that, who it works in and why, um, but I just thought I'd bring that up. Um, the next one, I'm going fast, you see, so you guys can have lunch. The next one is GLP-1 agonists, um, Bieta or Xenotide. You've probably seen studies on this that were done in Australia. Um, it's also used to treat type 2 diabetes. Um, it causes weight loss, delayed gastric emptying, and improvement in satiety. There was a study done in Australia, which was published in 2011, reporting that there was improvement in certain levels of gut hormones um, that signal satiety with giving um, um, and they had decreases in their subjective hunger scores. Um, however, my problem with this study was that their um, um, indices of satiety were um, a subjective hunger score from you know, 0 to 10, and it showed a, a full plate and an empty plate. Where do you feel along this spectrum? So I don't know how real that perception of satiety was, how much that's going to correlate with if you actually sent the child out afterwards and or had it at home, how much would they actually benefit from it. And there's a danger to it as well. As you may know, individuals with Prader-Willi do have delayed gastric empty anyway. And if they get into a lot of food, they can actually rupture their stomach from having too much food in their stomach um, because it will just sit there. They don't vomit it up and it doesn't go the other way. So it sits in their stomach. So I'm concerned that if we give them a medicine that further delays gastric emptying and they actually get into a lot of food, then we could potentially be setting them up for disaster. So I'm not saying this isn't a medication that needs to be further studied. I do think it needs to be further studied. I'm just saying those are my concerns with the medication because I want you all to be aware of them. Diazoxide is another medication that's currently being um, looked at um, very early and being looked at. Um, and so um, 
as Rachel will talk about a little bit later on, um, the endpoint of the leptin signaling pathway in hypothalamic neurons is the potassium ATP channel. Loss of the major 2 gene, which occurs in prader willi syndrome, um, appears to disrupt the leptin signaling pathway so that the body believes it's in a constant state of, her, of starvation. So the body then develops hyperphagia, increased rate of adipose tissue deposition, decreased metabolic rate, and growth hormone deficiency. So treatment with diazoxide, which is a potassium ATP agonist may bypass that signaling defect and um, actually compensate for that delayed or that absent um, leptin signal in the hypothalamus. In studies of animals that were rendered hyperphagic by brain lesions, um, diazoxide actually decreased their hyperphagia significantly. And when combined with metformin, diazoxide actually had improvements um, with weight gain in children with other hypothalamic causes of obesity. Studies haven't been done yet. Um, it's very early. Early, and there is a person in the room who I can direct you to who has much more diazoxide knowledge than I do um, if you want to talk to her more about it. So this is one of my favorite slides because I always tell people to pick the child with Prader Willi and you really can't do it um, and that's him. Um, so you can see that he's got good weight control, um, he's been on growth hormone therapy um, and you can't pick him out of a crowd which is my goal for all of the children that we follow with Prader Willi syndrome. And that's all and I put Reagan up there just for you. <laughs> Any questions? Well, of course. All right. Eat, and then we'll do questions. <laughs> no, you don't have to apologize. <laughs> so the one thing I, I do have to warn you about Dr. Miller, and some of us have seen this, is that if you actually have little children with PWS, then uh, there's a good chance she's actually going to steal your children. She's always seen at a conference at the back holding on to the little babies. I do steal them. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, that we really love about Dr. Miller. Not only her expertise and her thorough understanding, which is what we've seen, um, and the research and the clinical work, but the fact that she really loves our children. And she's doing that for the same reason that, that we're doing that. So apart from your expertise and your love for our children, we'd just like to thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you. And we're going to bring for lunch now, but uh, before we do it,